In a previous video, we discussed the silviculture of a mixed wood stand with a very strong component of American beech. Now, upon close and careful examination of that stand, its condition, and its potential future growth trajectory, I decided it was best to remove that beech via an herbicidal treatment. And now the day has come. It is time to kill some beech. All right, now if you haven't seen that video, I really recommend watching it because I go over a lot of um, the problems with American beech and the problems it can pose and why exactly I'm going to be doing this treatment. So I think it's a really important context to get before you watch this video. But uh, nonetheless, I can give a quick rundown. Now the real problem with American beech is that it reproduces from its roots and from its stump. So it's very hard to get rid of mechanically. It kind of lives as a root system more than a tree. And while a lot of species can do this and it can be fairly beneficial, especially in the case of the management of let's say quaking aspen, uh, American beech has additional problems on top of that that make it fairly worthless. In particular, it's really vulnerable to beech bark disease and that creates a lot of cankers on its bark renders it fairly useless for any sort of timber production, and even inhibits its ability to produce mast, which renders it fairly worthless from a wildlife perspective as well. And so you have a very low value species that's taking up a lot of growing space, and then shading out other more valuable species and preventing them from growing at the rates they otherwise would. So there's a huge cost associated with growing this particular species. Now here in Northern Maine, we're no stranger to low value species. We have some of the most diverse forests in the entire United States, and so there are plenty of species that simply don't fetch that high of a price on the timber market. But none of them pose the same problem as beech because they don't re-sprout from the roots and the stumps. In most cases, you can go in and remove these species as part of a normal silvicultural harvest. But beech acts as a hydra. The more you cut it, the more it re-sprouts. This happens to the point where beech stands that have been heavily harvested have regrown in sort of walls and thickets of beech where it's almost a monoculture of this disease-ridden species. So really the best way to deal with this species is with an herbicidal treatment. Now there are plenty of ways to apply herbicide and likely the most popular is going to be a foliar application with a spray or a mist. And this can be done aerially with a helicopter or even a mist blower that you can wear on your back. But in my case, that's not a very good solution because there are a lot of herbicide vulnerable species that I'm trying to grow as part of the management of that stand, namely quaking aspen. So I'm going to be using a very selective and very stem specific application method called stem injection, also known more colloquially as hack and squirt. So as you may have been able to guess from that name, I'm going to be using this machete and I'm going to hack a little bit into the stem at about a 45 degree angle to create an opening in the cambium. And then I'm going to have a little spray bottle full of an herbicide formulation that I'm going to be spraying into that wound. And that tree will then be able to take up that chemical, take it down into its roots, and then kill the entire organism. Now here's what makes this treatment so effective. If you remember from earlier, beech is able to sprout new stems from the same root system. And when I'm applying this herbicide into this wound, it's carrying that chemical down into its roots and by extension into those individuals that have sprouted up. So by treating one stem, I can actually get treatment to multiple stems. In fact, there are studies that show adequate control of the species just by applying the herbicide to either larger stems or smaller stems. By applying the chemical only to one or the other cohort, it then spreads to the other cohort. Now we'll get into my exact methodology a little bit later, but first I want to discuss some of the tools we'll be using. So first up, as I said, I will be using a machete. Now you can pretty much use any cutting tool you want. Hatchets are a pretty popular tool, and in fact one study I was looking at actually used a hatchet that was ground down on both sides, so it was only about an inch and a half in width. And that way when they cut into the tree it created a little pocket with you know sides to encapsulate the chemical. And uh, I might try that someday. They also sell commercially actual hatchets that have a little injection mechanism, so when the blade hits the tree it will automatically inject a pre-measured amount of herbicide but uh, those are fairly expensive and I don't have experience with them. I have heard they don't work that well though. So, so far in my experience, I found that the machete works the best, but whatever tool you use, I recommend that you make sure it is sharp. Beech bark is very thick and it tends to deflect blows if the tool isn't properly sharpened and that can be relatively dangerous. So while walking around in the woods with a razor sharp tool can create its own problems, it's also dangerous when you hit a tree with a dull blade and it bounces off towards your foot. 
Now for the actual pesticide application, I'll be using a regular spray bottle. Now spray bottles can be bought for pretty cheap, pretty much anywhere, uh, but there's kind of a range in their quality. You can go to Dollar Tree and get one for 99 cents, but remember that you're probably going to be pulling this trigger about a thousand times or more. So an overly cheap spray bottle is probably not gonna be able to hold up to that stress. I bought this one at Tractor Supply for, I think it was about $6, and it is rated specifically for pesticidal application. So the quality and build is a little better than what you might otherwise find. Whatever you end up using, I highly recommend that you use it as a designated pesticide application tool and you label it as such. Otherwise, next year you could dig out of the garage, it could have a little bit of residue on it and you could use it to spritz your house plants in. Well, the results aren't gonna to be too great. Now, of course, let's talk about the actual pesticide that I'll be using. For this specific application, I have a formulation of 53.8% glyphosate. Now, often this will come in the store in a 41.2% formulation. And uh, honestly, the reason I have this one is because it was all they had at the store at the time. The shelves were almost completely empty. And that's fine because either will work fine. Um, if you do other applications, you might have to adjust the formulation a little. It's not gonna matter much here. Um, so either one will work fine. The one thing, however, is it cannot be the RTU or ready to use formulations they might see on the store. So the, uh, the Roundup that's used for you know everyday use. That's at a concentration of about 2%. Uh, that's really not meant for this sort of application. You might see a little bit of effectiveness, but it's not gonna be very high. So make sure it's a concentrated variety. Now, one important point to make about pesticide application in general is anytime you do something like this, the chemical you buy is going to come with a label. And this label is not something to be ignored. Uh, these labels are very different from other labels you might come across in the world of consumer products. Uh, this has everything you need to know about, um, you know, storage, disposal, application, application rates, uh, the propensity for drift or soil runoff, anything you need to know. Any time that you're using a chemical that you're not familiar with, it's really good practice to read through the entire label. You know, skipping, of course, the parts that are obviously not applicable to you. I'm not going to read the, uh, the parts about cotton production, for example, but uh, this is going to tell you everything that you should know. For example, every uh, chemical is going to come with recommendations for personal protective equipment. And for glyphosate, the recommended equipment is long sleeve shirt, long pants, sh and shoes and socks. Now it's a really great thing that I read that because I actually was going to apply without pants on today, but I decided against it after reading the label. And of course you can always use additional protective equipment as well. Today it's actually fairly cold and uh, I'm going to be mixing this glyphosate with water. And by the end of the day, sometimes the spray bottles can get a little drippy and leaky. And so to keep my hand dry, I'm actually gonna be wearing a glove on my applicator hand. And when I apply this glyphosate, I'm going to be mixing it with 50% water. So now let's get into the process of mixing. So even though glyphosate's fairly benign, it doesn't have any soil activity and there's very little risk of runoff, whenever you're mixing pesticides, it's a good habit to uh, use some sort of spill safe surface. In this case, I store my things in a uh, plastic Tupperware container, so I'm just using the cover. And uh, so once you have something like that, uh, you're gonna need a little bit of water, uh, your spray bottle, a funnel, and of course your chemical. Now, we're going to be mixing at a, at a rate of 50% uh, water with 50% chemical. And uh, one thing that I forgot to mention about the spray bottles was one of the benefits of using one designated for pesticide application is it usually has the volume markings. So it really helps you um, get the right mix. So in my case, I'm going to start out by filling it with 15 fluid ounces of glyphosate and then filling the rest up with water. All right, so now that we have our glyphosate successfully mixed, I'm gonna grab my machete and we'll be on our way. But first I wanted to address something. Now, undoubtedly this is on some of your minds, but glyphosate is a fairly controversial pesticide and it really shouldn't be. Now, I'm not gonna to get too much into it here because really I can make an entire video about this, but suffice to say, it has been around for 50 years and it is the most studied herbicide in the world. It has been thoroughly reviewed by the American EPA, the Canadian Pesticide Regulatory Agency, 
various European regulatory agencies, and it has never been found to be a carcinogen. Now, I'm going to put a bunch of links in the description to various statements from those regulatory agencies, but I don't think it's going to do much to persuade you if uh, you, you don't agree with the chemical. Uh, unfortunately, this is a very emotion-laden debate, and sometimes there can be kind of a lack of logic and reason in those debates. Now, I have heard a lot of different things from a lot of different people, and some of them are a little bit silly and others demonstrably false. Um, I know, you know, some people are of the mindset that uh, regulatory boards have essentially been hijacked by uh, various pesticide producers to cover up, you know, evidence of toxicity. Now, I myself am not necessarily the most trustful of government agencies, but uh, I don't really understand what the incentive would be there. Glyphosate is no longer proprietary. There are many people who produce it. If anything, the incentive would be to ban it to move the market towards more profitable, more proprietary chemicals. Another thing that I've heard, which was just very, very silly, uh, I was listening to somebody talk about the medicinal benefits of dandelions, and that's all well and good. But uh, then he started to link it with uh, Bayer, who actually purchased Monsanto. Um, so Bayer is now the producer of Rodeo. And he was trying to link some sort of conspiracy between uh, the desire to kill dandelions with rodeo with Bayer's production of aspirin um, in order to, you know, prevent dandelions and the medicinal benefits from becoming known. Now, that's a really hot take, but glyphosate kills grass, so nobody uses it for dandelion control on their lawns. That said, I really hate mowing my lawn, so I have thought about it once or twice. Now, normally I wouldn't really care about this sort of thing, and everyone's entitled to have the opinions they want, but there are real consequences here. I truly believe that glyphosate is one of the most utilitarian and least costly in terms of externalities, pesticides that you can use. Now, I happen to have a fairly broad knowledge of pesticides, at least forestry rated pesticides. I used to be licensed as a master pesticide applicator in the state of Maine, and I, and I often found that glyphosate was actually the most benign chemical to use in a variety of situations. And I actually think the best example for that is this application we're doing today. Now glyphosate is not actually the most efficacious chemical to use for this application. There was a study they did that tested both imazapyr and glyphosate in this same sort of situation, and the imazapyr was actually more effective. Now imazapyr, sold under the name of Arsenal, is really great for a lot of things, but it has one problem. It has soil activity, which means, which, and that means that the active ingredient stays active in the soil for long after it's applied. Glyphosate does not have that soil activity. In fact, it has almost the exact opposite. It has a very strong soil adsorption rating, which means that when it comes in contact with soil particles, the glyphosate bonds to the soil particles, it neutralizes it, and from there it breaks down. Glyphosate does this so readily that in the south and midwest where the water might be a little muddy, if a farmer were to mix the glyphosate with muddy water, he could spray that mix on his field and it would do absolutely nothing because the clay particles in the mud bonded with the glyphosate and neutralized it. Now in my situation, I have an application site with two species that reproduce readily vegetatively, aspen and beech. One of these is my target species, beech. The other is a crop tree, aspen. There's a possibility that some of the aspen roots might be grafted to the beech roots. If this is the case, then I could cause damage to those crop trees from treating the beech. Now, because imazapyr remains active in the soils, there's a higher risk for this. I deliberately chose to use a less effective chemical to limit potential damage to non-target species. And I might be overthinking it a little, but uh, I was reading about that in a study and I chose to use glyphosate. And I'll, I'll link to that study in the description if you're interested in seeing it. It might be interesting to read anyway. Uh, it pertains a lot to what we'll be doing today. But while this situation might be a little bit unique, there are many situations where glyphosate can do the same job very effectively with a lot less potential harms. Now I've had enough of these discussions with people to know that I'm not likely to change anybody's mind. So uh, if, if you take away anything from this, take away this. I think it's important to ask whether or not we're against glyphosate or pesticides in general. If you're against pesticides personally, that's fine. I understand that. But if you're against glyphosate, you're against a very specific chemical. And 
if the other chemicals are actually worse and you're not necessarily as well informed about those chemicals, you're not moving the world in a direction of not using pesticides, you're moving the world in a direction of using worse pesticides. So I think it's important to be absolutely honest about what our intentions are. And like I said, I absolutely respect the decision to not use pesticides on your property. If you want to do things more organic, that's fine. I just want to make sure that if we are going to use pesticides, they're the most beneficial and least harmful chemicals we can possibly get. And I really believe that glyphosate fills that purpose quite well. All right. Uh, I just felt like it was important to kind of talk about that and get that out of the way because I know somebody would bring it up in the comments otherwise. Um, and maybe you learned something from it. But now we can actually get started with the application because i got a lot of work to do. So let's get started and look at exactly how we're going to do this. So let's talk a little bit about the actual procedure here. So like I said earlier, I'm going to be cutting into the stem and then injecting the herbicide a little bit. So. I make the, the cut into the stem, and then I like to bend it a little bit to open it up, and then I put the nozzle right up to the wound, and I spray just enough to fill the wound, and then it's done. Now you're gonna wanna make one cut for about every inch in diameter on the tree. Now I said earlier that there are studies that show that you can get either control of small stems by targeting large stems, or large stems by targeting small stems. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be limiting my treatment to stems up to 10 inches in diameter, mostly because at that size, it's pretty difficult to get that many cuts into the stem, and I'd rather just ignore it. On the other hand, if a stem is too small, it might be pretty difficult to get a good wound on it with a machete. So uh, if it's too small, I'm just gonna skip it and uh, count on that more systemic action of the chemical. And so basically, I just keep doing that with every beech tree I come across. And I'm gonna be kind of going back and forth, scanning the area. Now, I did want to make a little bit of a note about the time of year to do this. Now, according to the studies, uh, you really shouldn't be doing this at times of leaf off, so November to April. That said, somebody much more knowledgeable than I has said that it works just fine in the winter. Uh, I have not done that myself, uh, but I think one benefit of doing that is you'll be able to see the tracks in the snow, and you can do this a little bit more systematically. Um, I think the worst thing that would happen is that it doesn't necessarily have the efficacy that it otherwise would, but you know, you can make the decision whether or not you want to do that or not. Another thing you might be able to do to be able to mark out where exactly you're going is uh, glyphosate is rated for use with dyes, agricultural dyes. So if you can get your hands on some of that, you know, you can make the color blue and you'll be able to see the blue color all through the woods. Another thing to remember just real quick is uh, whatever blade you happen to be using, Remember that glyphosate comes in a formulation that is uh, binded to a salt particle. So it is a salt-based formula. Whatever you spray it on is going to rust. So it's a good idea to clean off whatever tool you're using afterwards. So now let's just continue on and I'm just gonna keep hacking away and squirting the trees. It's probably two inches. Whoops. Okay. So here we have a great example of both exactly how uh, beech sprouts, but also how we're going to deal with it. So we have here the oldest beech stem which is probably, I don't know, eight, 10 inches in diameter. We have directly next to it, coming from its roots, a bunch of two to three inch sprouts. And then on this side, we have kind of coming from the same organism, this kind of wall of beech that I was talking about, the, the hydra mechanism. Now, most of these are gonna to be too small to actually hit with the machete, and that's fine. Likewise, this one is probably going to be too big. It takes too many hits. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna target the kind of two to three inch stems. And then over here, there's uh, two one inch stems in the back. And I think if I just get those, it'll have enough systemic effect to uh, kill the entire root organism and all the other little sprouts. So let's get started there. Oops. There. 
So, so far we've been kind of at the edge of the stand where peach has been a little here and there, but as you can see, we're kind of getting into the core of the problem. Now, beech tends to hold its leaves longer than other species. So these yellow green colors you see here, that's all beech. Maybe there might be a little sugar maple thrown in, but uh, most of it's beech. And that's the real problem that we're addressing is it's really just kind of taken over certain areas. And it's really suppressing other more valuable species. And here, suffering in the understory of this American beech, we have a young red spruce who will now be free to grow and uh, become a productive member of this forest. But next to him is a less desirable balsam fir, and because of this close apart, I don't really want him competing, so uh, I'm gonna get rid of that fir right now. Good luck, red spruce. Well, I think we can call that good for now. Uh, we've got this entire stand done. Now, what's important to remember is how long this uh, takes to take effect. You're probably not going to actually see the results until the next growing season. You might start to see some difference in the leaves, you know, the looks of them, the, the color in a few weeks, but you're not actually going to tell, you're not gonna be able to make any judgment about the efficacy of the treatment until the next year when the leaves actually come out again. So have patience and, um, you know, the good thing about this treatment, it's extremely cost effective. The biggest, in, the biggest cost is really just your time. So if you need to do a little bit of retreatment, uh, that's not a big deal. So I'm really excited to see what the final outcome of this will be. Uh, there, are so, there are some areas that were so inundated with beech that we might have a few small openings and that's fine. That's just opportunity to regrow more valuable species. And I know there are plenty of softwoods that are gonna have the opportunity now to really grow fast and strong. So that's great and I can't wait to come back next year and see what the results are. So that does it for this video and this treatment. Uh, we have a lot more on the way, so if you guys enjoyed this, please like and subscribe, and there'll be more for you shortly. Till next time, later.